All right, well, let's open up, if we could, with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for today and grateful for this morning. And we're grateful for your word and your truth. I just ask, Father, that um, you would be seen this morning. And uh, I just pray that you'll be with us uh, in our two sessions to, uh, today, Sunday school and the main service that follows, that you, you would use these times in your word to edify your people. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. All right, well, it's good to see everybody today. And... We are uh, continuing our teaching on the rapture. We're actually in uh, part five of our series on the rapture. And here's uh, basically what we've gone over so far. Um, We've talked about what the rapture is from basically two primary areas of the Bible. uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. 13 through 18 and 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 through 58. And we've developed really 10 points about the rapture just to help us understand what it is. And probably nothing that we've talked about thus far is controversial. I mean, maybe some of it is, but now we're moving into the real controversial subject as we're switching away from what is the rapture, and now we're moving into when is the rapture. And what I mean by when is the rapture is not, you know, July 3rd or something like, <laughs> something like that. Uh, we're not getting into date setting. We're getting into, because no one knows the day or the hour, amen? The rapture could happen before this lesson is over. Some of you might be praying for that to happen as we get further here in our lesson. But we're dealing with when will the rapture take place relative to the coming seven-year tribulation period. So amongst people who believe in, A, a coming seven-year tribulation period, as described in the book of Revelation, and B, a kingdom which will follow that tribulation period. There happens to be a big debate, this has been going on for over a hundred years, concerning when does the rapture take place relative to that time frame. So one of the things that's interesting about Bible prophecy is the big debates about it don't so much center on the what questions, but the when questions. For example, you take the doctrine of the kingdom. I mean, everybody believes in a kingdom. The issue isn't, do you believe in a kingdom? The issue is, when does the kingdom come? So there are those that place the kingdom today before the second advent, and then there are those that place the kingdom, like ourselves, in the future after the second advent. And so you'll notice there that that's not a debate about what. To some extent it is, but it's a debate about when. And, you know, you run into a lot of Christians and they say, I don't believe in a rapture. Well, the fact of the matter is every Christian believes in a rapture. Um, Those that put it at the very end of the seven-year tribulation period believe it happens just before Jesus comes back in his second advent. We go up just to come back down again. So that's a debate not... What is the rapture? Everybody believes in a rapture of some kind, but it's a question of when. So the real controversies in Bible prophecy start to take place when you move away from the what question to the when question. And our church takes a position on the when question. Uh, We believe, first of all, related to the kingdom, that you won't see one iota of the kingdom until after Jesus comes back. So we are premillennialists, meaning Jesus comes back first and then the kingdom comes. And we are actually also in the area of the rapture, pre-tribulationalists, meaning the rapture will take place first, pre 
before the seven year tribulation period that's prophesied in the Bible transpires. So we believe that the church will not see one nanosecond, one iota of the coming seven year tribulation period. So our eschatological position is basically what's called pre-pre. I mean, we're so pre-pre, I, I feel guilty eating post-toasties in the morning. <laughs> Pre-tribulational with the rapture, pre-millennial related to the kingdom. And so we're taking a position on the when question, and that's where the controversy starts. So here are the major rapture views. At the top of the screen, you'll see the view I just articulated, pre-tribulationalism, meaning the church is removed before the tribulation period even starts. Against that view are other timing views. There's the mid-tribulational view. The rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation. Probably the dominant view in church history would be post-tribulationalism. The rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation period. And then, as, as if all of that weren't complicated enough, um, around, I don't know, 1990 roughly, a man named Marvin Rosenthal popularized a book. Uh, the book originally was written by a man named Van Campen. And Van Campen, in his book, basically argued that the wrath of God is not something that starts until roughly, and they're not ironclad on the percentage, but roughly the final 25% of the tribulation period. And so since the church has been promised an exemption from divine wrath, these people believe that the church is actually going to be here for three quarters of the tribulation period before she's raptured out, before the final 25%, before the wrath of God starts. So, you know, I like to refer to these folks as uh, pre, uh, three quarters rapturous because they're basically saying the church is going to be here for roughly three quarters of the tribulation period. And so Van Campen introduced that view and then Marvin Rosenthal uh, sort of popularized it. And then if all of that weren't complicated enough, there's a view there at the bottom that's so strange, I can't even put it on a chart, but it's basically called the partial rapture position. And the partial rapture position is the view that when Jesus comes back in the rapture, he's only coming back for some Christians. He's not coming back for all Christians. Those Christians that are not yielded to Jesus Christ will not be taken in the rapture. And so the purpose of the tribulation period, one of its purposes is to straighten out Christians that don't have their priorities right. And as their priorities get straightened out one by one in the tribulation period, they're raptured at different times. So that's basically what's called the partial rapture view. I was watching um, the ESPN series, uh, The Last Dance, which has come out on sort of a documenting the Chicago Bulls and their string of champion, championships, two three-peats, six championships total from around, I don't know, 1991 roughly to 1998. And I was very interested what the movie had to say about Phil Jackson, their coach, during a lot of that time period. Because Phil Jackson, you know, is very into, and I knew this at the time, into Zen Buddhism and Eastern mysticism. And so I'm always curious, you know, what would push somebody in that direction. And it comes out in this particular documentary that Phil Jackson's father was a pastor and his mother was a minister. They didn't give the denomination, but it comes out in this documentary that in that particular denomination, they were believers in the the way it, Phil, Phil Jackson described it, the partial rapture position. And so he, believe, he was taught to believe that, oh my goodness, if you weren't in church and on your knees at the point of the rapture, you wouldn't be taken. And we believe that's an incorrect rapture position, but you can see how being taught an incorrect view in a legalistic context pushes you 
into other things you want to explore like Eastern mysticism and Phil Jackson who was an NBA star himself in his day you know in this particular documentary said well I I didn't want to be on my knees (laughs) at that point I wanted to be out playing basketball so he ha- I think the way the documentary presented it, he had some kind of distorted view, uh, some kind of legalistic understanding, and it pushed him over the course of time away from Christianity into experimentation with uh, drugs and Eastern mysticism and all of these kinds of things. But anyway, I found that, found that interesting because that just came out a week or two ago. So anyway, those are the basic rapture positions, and and what we believe is the top view, that the church will be removed from the earth before the seven-year tribulation period even starts, and beneath it you see what the mid-trib view looks like, the post-trib view looks like, it sort of sandwiches the rapture and the second coming almost in a single event, where the church goes up only to come back down to the earth again immediately. And you start to see problems with that third one for the simple reason that why is Jesus preparing for us heavenly dwellings in his Father's house if they're going to be unused? John 14, 1 through 3, more on that later. And then at the very bottom you see this pre-wrath rapture view where the church is going to be raptured somewhere in the second half of the tribulation period. So what we're going to try to argue for is seven reasons why we believe the pre-tribulational rapture view is correct. And after we lay out the case for that, I'll interact with the other views. Obviously, there's a, such a, a, a mass amount of information here, I can't do it in one particular teaching. So this will draw out for the next few weeks. But even before we get to that, I want people to understand something. And I had a hard time coming to grips with this myself because when I first began to study the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I thought it made sense biblically. I'll explain why it makes sense biblically. And I was sort of blindsided by the complete and total hatred that people have for this eschatological position. Uh, If you do any research on it, you'll see people writing entire, you know, multi-hundred page, sometimes thousand page tomes, you know, trying to refute this. And if you spend any time on social media or... Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, I mean, you'll see some of the biggest knockdown, drag out fights over this issue. And so it's sort of blindsiding to understand that there are people that are completely 100% invested. And it's almost like their whole being and their whole ministry, I'll put that in quotation marks, is vested in trying to debunk this because they think it's a myth and they think it's destructive for the body of Christ and they think it creates an escapist mentality. And, you know, if we believe this, then we don't care about the culture and we're abandoning the culture and there's all these arguments that they make, mostly non-textual. And so let me give you some representative quotes just to acquaint us with the fact that this doctrine uh, is something that if you believe it, you'll, you'll be immediately challenged on it, and so you need to know what you believe and why. And a lot of these t- attacks, sadly, are not coming from atheists, they're not coming from secularists, they're not coming from humanists, they're coming from people within organized Christendom or Christianity. Some of the biggest opponents of this position, the pre-tribulational rapture position, are believers in Christ themselves. So here's a few quotes just to get the point across. Here's a man named Rick Joyner. Rick Joyner is very involved, um, as far as I can tell, in what's called the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation which basically is the belief that there are modern-day apostles today working miracles. And they believe that they're pursuing what's called the Seven Mountains Mandate. A lot of this is headquartered today. It's 
It's interesting as you study it over the course of several decades, it's been headquartered in different places, different manifestations of it. There used to be a group called the Kansas City Prophets, and we could go on and on uh, talking about how the different emanations of this. Today, the main center of thought is in uh, Redding, California, Northern California. And Rick Joyner apparently is aligned somewhat with this movement, and he says the doctrine of the rapture was a great and effective use of the enemy. See, it's interesting how they want to blame this whole thing on Satan. They, they use the, the harshest language they can think of to debunk the rapture. If you believe in a pre-trib rapture, you're influenced by Satan to implant in the church a retreat mentality. So we're sitting around in their minds waiting for the rapture and we don't care about the culture and we're not pursuing the seven mountains mandate and so they're out to debunk the rapture. Joyner says already this yoke has been cast off by the majority of the, notice this, advancing church. In other words, if, you're, if you believe in the rapture, you're not advancing. So they basically are kingdom now in their belief system and the seven mountains mandate is this idea that the church is going to take over the seven major influencers of the culture. Politics, media, uh, entertainment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which, which is, by the way, is not the Great Commission. So they see the rapture as antithetical to this kingdom now. I would argue it's sort of a post-millennial understanding. Already this yoke has been cast off by the majority of the advancing church, and soon it will be cast off by all Christians. Now, Alex Jones, I, don't have any, I didn't have any quote from him for this, uh, partly because the stuff he says is so coarse, and he uses so much profanity, it's obviously not something I can or would want to share in a church environment. But you can find Alex Jones of InfoWars, which is basically a website which is very conspiratorial. There's a one world government coming. And part of me is sympathetic to that because I believe in all of that. But he says patriots need to rise up and challenge the new world order and these kinds of things. So far, so good. But he goes so far as to say that the rapture is a doctrine that was planted into the church by the one worlders or by the globalists for the purpose of neutralizing the church. So Alex Jones has the same mentality here as uh, Rick Joyner. And then some of the latest outbursts have come from an individual named Rick Wiles of True News. True News is very interesting because he's the owner of that particular news outlet and they're actually invited to or participate in you know, Pres President Trump's briefings. Uh, if you watch cable news very carefully, you'll see sometimes a reporter from True News is being given a chance to ask the president or his cabinet a question. And the more you get into the mind of Rick Wiles, you see he is totally uh, determined to tear down the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture. He said recently, I personally do not believe that by the year 2020... Now, he's obviously missed that one because we're, st we're still here. I personally do not believe by the year 2020 any credible person will be teaching the secret pre-trib rapture doctrine. Now, when someone calls the rapture a secret pre-trib rapture doctrine, you know you're dealing with an opponent of the rapture. Because none of us have ever referred to that doctrine as a secret you know, rapture. In fact, when, the, when it happens, not only will you have all of these people missing from the earth, I mean, what's secret about that? But those involved with it will hear the voice of an archangel. It doesn't sound very secret or quiet to me. I personally do not believe that by the year 2020, any credible person, notice the word credible, if you're teaching this, you're not credible as a Bible teacher. I personally do not believe that by the year 2020, any credible person will be teaching the secret pre-trib rapture doctrine. I think the events that are coming in the next five years will utterly destroy the doctrine. 
Rick Wiles, as he's being interviewed or talking on his show, says the secret pre-trib rapture story and Christian Zionism. Now, Christian Zionism, what is that? That's just the belief that Israel is going to go back into their land and become a thriving nation. You know, exactly what Ezekiel 36 and 37 says. And so if you believe in that and you believe that's happening today, they call you a Zionist. So I guess I'm a, a Zionist. I mean, because I, I believe God is at work today in the nation of Israel. Although they're not nationally saved yet, they will be. He says, the secret pre-trib rapture story in Christian Zionism, that is a two-headed monster. And his person on there with him, uh, his foil, I might call him, Doc Burkhart, says, monster. Rick Wiles, monster. It's a two-headed freak monster. Okay, they come together, both of them come together because they were started by the same people. The Christian Zionists started the pre-trib rapture doctrine. So this belief in a future for Israel and a coming of Jesus for his church before the tribulation period is part of what they think is a Zionist plot. And I'll be showing you these quotes that they think the Jews, you know, have taken over everything. The Jews have taken over the banks. I mean, that, that, this kind of thinking isn't new. It goes back to um, a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is, quite frankly, a piece of anti-Semitic garbage. And it blames the Jews for all of the problems in the world. And Rick Wiles sadly is going this direction and he thinks that somehow the Zionists in this conspiracy invented the pre-trib rapture doctrine to neutralize the church. You know, to me, I mean, it's, it's crazy because every time you study the rapture in the Bible, it's connected to daily life. Prayer, patience, we've looked at some of those passages. So it doesn't neutralize Christians. In fact, it's the exact opposite. And this idea that, oh, we're just sitting around waiting for the rapture, so we're letting the culture fall apart, that idea is very quickly refuted when you understand that Dr. Tim LaHaye, who probably is known for um, exporting the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture more than any other man in modern times, that I can think of, other than perhaps Hal Lindsey. Tim LaHaye doing this through his Left Behind series. Tim LaHaye is the one that gave the, the idea to the late Dr. Jerry Falwell to start the moral majority. And if you remember the 1980s, you remember the moral majority. The moral majority was let's get Christians involved in politics. And probably Ronald Reagan became president during that time, partially because of the influence of the moral majority. So that disproves the idea that if you're interested in the rapture, you don't care about the culture. But anyway, he, he talks about how they come together, both of them come together. They were started by the same people, the Christian Zionists started the pre-trib rapture doctrine, his interviewer says, and this was the seed planted decades ago, but it came to full fruit within the last 30 years. Rick Wiles says, that's right. They had to create the pre-trib rapture doctrine to justify Zionism. That's where it all came from. But isn't it interesting that in recent decades, where the American evangelical church has been taken over by Christian Zionism, that the American church has lost its flavor. His interviewer, yes, Rick Wiles. It has lost its saltiness. It is of no use anymore to God in this country. Interviewer, right. In fact, these things are worse off than they were 30 years ago. Rick Wiles, we've become a pagan nation. Interviewer, we're Babylon. Rick Wiles, we're Babylon, and it happened on the watch of the Christian Zionists. I'm laying it on your doorstep, Christian Zionists. You are the cause of America's decline. His interviewer says, those are strong words. 
Rick Wiles, they are strong words, and I mean it. They took control of the churches, the Christian Zionists did. They changed the gospel. They took Jesus off the cross. They replaced the cross with the Star of David. They took the focus off God and holiness. They put it all on a piece of land in the Middle East. And America has gone to hell. And it's sort of interesting to watch this. You can Google this and watch this whole exchange on video today. How animated he gets as he keeps talking. They put it all on a piece of land in the Middle East and America has gone to hell. America has gone to hell. We become a pagan, heathen nation because the Christian Zionists have taken our eyes off of Jesus. And I read that and I say, gosh, I didn't know I was that bad. I mean, all I do is love the coming of Christ for his church. I'm not taking, the, <laughs> I'm not taking anybody's eyes off Jesus. And, you know, to blame the decline of the United States for people believing in this doctrine. How do you explain the rise of the moral majority in the 1980s, created by Tim LaHaye, a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, what he calls a Zionist. And also I read these quotes about the decline of America and I say, gosh, can't we give the unbelievers any credit at all for the, for the, <laughs> for the destruction of America? I mean, I didn't know it was all our fault, but this is the kind of rhetoric you run into. Rick uh, Wiles is <clears throat> gradually becoming more and more what I would call anti-Semitic um, in his going on and on about how, you know, uh, you know the, the elders of the Protocols of Zion mentality blaming all of the problems in the world on the Jews. And he did this recently related to Trump's impeachment. And here's somebody on Twitter calling him out for it. And it says, unreal anti-Semitism from Rick Wiles at True News. And you know, you, you read that True News, you can't think of a more, more mislabeled news outlet than that, can you? Unreal anti-Semitism coming from Rick Wiles at True News as he calls the Trump impeachment a Jew coup. That's a direct quote. He says, what's happening to Donald Trump with impeachment is a Jew coup. The Jews are behind it all, in other words. And he says the Jews, he goes on and he says the Jews are going to take over the country and kill millions of Christians. Now... Are there some Jews involved in the impeachment of Donald Trump? Well, of course there are, but I could name a lot of Jews that were against it. Uh, Dennis Prager, against it. Uh, ben Shapiro, uh, against it. Michael Medved, uh, against it. Um, so to stereotype an entire race and blame the impeachment of Donald Trump on that race is really taking the church, in my opinion, back to the dark ages where this kind of unfettered anti-Semitism existed throughout the Middle Ages and even into the Protestant Reformation itself. And so our attitude towards the Jews is Romans 11. Though currently they are your enemies in the sense that in the book of Acts they were oppressing the gospel, I don't know how much they're oppressing the gospel today, but they certainly were doing it in the book of Acts. Paul says in Romans 8, they are still beloved on behalf of the patriarchs. So that's how we look at Israel. That's how we look at Jews. We look at them as people that God has made a covenant with. God loves them. And God is going to complete an unfinished work in and through them. Even though we may not agree with every little thing they do, Today, we certainly don't agree with their theology. And of course, there are many Jews that get saved today. I wouldn't say it's a major majority in the church, but there are many. And so we rejoice in their salvation as well. Um, this one was sad for me to document because I've always had a high opinion of David Barton and his Wall Builders organization. I think he's done a good job. 
uh, sort of going back into the dustbin of history and demonstrating that America was established on a Judeo-Christian framework. But David Barton, for whatever reason, has become very anti-pre-trib rapture. And here he's rejoicing. You can listen to this on uh, rightwingwatch.org. <clears throat> he's basically rejoicing in how one of the Left Behind movies did not do well at the box office. And he says, the movie is a complete bust, Barton rejoiced. It did really pathetic at the box office, and quite frankly, I was somewhat happy that the movie was a bust. Barton said, the Left Behind series has convinced too many Christians that it's a waste of time to get involved. Barton was really grateful, and these are all direct quotes. You can see where the, my quotation mark begins. Barton was really grateful that the movie didn't go well because I didn't want that mentality going out there. It violates too many things of the Bible. Of course, the, the Left Behind series, as you know, was a, was a movie and a book series promoting the pre-tribulational rapture, the view that we teach here. I think the movie is not doing well is, well, a sign that hopefully our eschatology, pre-pre, is beginning to change for a more sound direction in America, he said. Maybe we're getting a little more mature and a little wiser over things. So his mindset is we need to sort of grow beyond uh, the teachings of the rapture, the pre-tribulational rapture, and we need to really get down to core business of taking America back. And I did notice that David Barton is a graduate of um, Oral Roberts University, which is you know, very charismatic in its belief system. And so there's a little, and you, you'll see David Barton appear on different shows, like with Kenneth Copeland, who, to my mind, is a rank heretic. And he'll show up quite frequently with Glenn Beck. You know, of course, I like a lot of the politics of Glenn Beck, but Glenn Beck's theology leaves obviously something to be desired because he is Mormon. And so there's this really good angle that he brings about retrieving American history, but after that, his theology sort of falls off the cliff. And he obviously doesn't have, in our view, the right eschatology. And he thinks our eschatology is actually holding back America or keeping Christians away from restoring America, when I don't think that's true, as evidenced by LaHaye giving Falwell the concept of the, of the moral majority. You, you can be a patriot and you can vote in every election, you know, I do, and you can care about the United States and still believe in a pre-trib rapture. And they're trying to make it sound like those two ideas are mutually exclusive, and they're, they're not. Here's a quote from Barbara Rothing. She is a academic, and she wrote a book called The Message of Hope in the Book of Revelation, and she says, quote, the rapture is a racket. I mean, like a crime racket? Uh, cr when I see the word racket, I'm thinking of like Al Capone. And, and see, you'll notice that the, the language that's used is so over the top, where they're saying it's Satan, and you're destroying the United States, and you're taking Jesus off the cross, and now she's using this, this crime syndicate kind of language. The rapture is a racket, whether prescribing a violent script. I didn't know I was violent. But she's saying I'm promoting violence by teaching this. Whether prescribing a violent script for Israel or survivalism in the United States. In other words, they want to link you with the militia movement here. Remember the militia movement. So if you believe in the rapture, you're obviously involved in the militia movement. So I'm, I guess I'm confused. I mean, one guy says we're not voting and we don't care about the United States. The next critic says, we're so aggressive, we're gonna bring violence to the United States via the militia movement. And so that's sort of how you recognize propaganda. You recognize propaganda because it self-contradicts itself consistently. She says, the rapture is a racket, whether prescribing a violent script for Israel or survivalism in the United States, this, this, this 
theology distorts God's vision for the world. This theology is not biblical. We are not raptured off the earth, nor is God. Now that's strange because I never thought we taught God is raptured off the earth. I thought it was God taking us off the earth into heaven. No, God has come to live in the world through Jesus. Yes, that's true. He was here for 33 years, 2,000 years ago. God created the world. God loves the world. And God will never leave the world behind. Aha, now we're getting to her issue. It's an ecological issue. And what's starting to drift into her thinking is pantheism where you confuse the creation with the creator. And uh, in essence, you start to worship the earth. So if that's your mentality, and I'm, you know, we should be good stewards of the earth, nothing wrong with that, but we don't, we certainly don't worship the earth. And so a mentality that says God is going to bring a series of judgments on this earth, evict Satan from this earth, establish his kingdom on this earth, and at the end of that thousand year kingdom, as Second Peter 3.10 says, destroy this earth by fire and replace it with a new heavens and new earth. That theology doesn't fit a pantheistic mentality. So her ecological mindset moves her in the direction against the pre-tribulational rapture and our whole eschatological viewpoint. This one is also sad because I think this man, William Lane Craig, has done a lot of good work defending the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's considered one of the most um, able apologists in Christianity today. And yet, when you actually look at some of the things William, Craig, William Lane Craig says about the rapture, he's very opposed to the pre-tribulational rapture viewpoint. He says, quote, the doctrine is not really found in the book of Revelation. If you read the book of Revelation, you won't find any of the rapture mentioned there. Well, that's because it's already been developed earlier in the upper room, in the Thessalonian epistles, and the book of Revelation is not just going to come along and restate everything. The book of Revelation, when you read it, assumes, and I'll be trying to demonstrate to everybody that this is true, assumes that by the time you get into chapter 4, the rapture of the church has already taken place. So here's a guy that's a very good philosopher and a, and a pretty good uh, historian and logician, but he's, he's not much of a Bible student. And this is what you find a lot of times is guys that are really good, let's say, at defending something related to Christianity like the resurrection. You can appreciate what they say in that area, but there's a tendency to accept everything they say. Even if they don't have any real demonstrated expertise in the area of Bible study, exegesis, systematic theology. He says the idea of the rapture comes from a misinterpretation of First and Second Thessalonians where Paul is describing the coming of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead, which will occur at his coming. So he thinks the two comings of Christ are one simultaneous event. So he's not paying attention to one of the points that we made very early in this series, that the rapture is described completely different than the second advent of Christ. So he's glossing over the differences there. He's actually committing a logical fallacy where he's assuming that similarity equals equality. You know, I've got two cars in my garage. They look a lot alike. They both have four tires and an engine and a steering column. Both of them need gasoline. But it's a mistake to say that car A equals car B because they're similar. So it's interesting that he is sort of held out as a logician but he's committing here a a basic logical fallacy where similarity is the same as equality. 
It says the idea of the rapture comes from a misinterpretation of First and Second Thessalonians, where Paul is describing the coming of the Lord and resurrection of the dead, which will occur at his coming. If you compare what Paul says there to what Jesus says about the end times, Paul uses the same vocabulary and same phraseology. Well, so what? I mean, I, I say to my wife, well, let's, let's, let's get in the car and go. And she says, well, what car are we going to take? Because we have two. So just because I use the same phraseology about both cars doesn't mean both cars equal the same thing. I think it's very plausible that Paul is talking about the same event that Jesus predicted, namely the visible coming of the Son of Man at the end of human history to usher in the kingdom. But the proponents of the rapture view say that Paul is not at all talking about the second coming of Christ there. What he's really talking about is the invisible preliminary, uh uh-oh, look at our next word there, secret. We've got a guy calling the rapture a secret rapture. So when you see the language secret rapture, nine times out of ten, I'll bet dollars to donuts on this one, it's a critic of the rapture. He says, is this invisible preliminary return of Christ to snatch believers out of the world before the great tribulation period? I think there is no textual warrant for that at all. A good many Bible-believing Christians absorb this view as their mother's milk, as it were, and have never thought to, to question its biblical credentials. So in other words, if you believe this, it's, it's just you were taught that. But you actually never turned your brain on to look at the Bible to see if these things be so. Now, I don't fit that stereotype because I was raised in an amillennial environment. If you ask me as a young person what, the, what my eschatological view would be, it would be amillennial, non-pre-tribulational, non-premillennial, and I switch my view because of the Bible. I switch my view because of my examination of what the biblical text was saying and not what everybody else was telling me. So, so they want to create this stereotype where if you believe in the pre-trib rapture, you just believe in it because someone told you about it, not because you've actually thought through the issues. He says it may be a good fiction. In other words, you're getting this from paperback bestsellers and movies, but it's not in the Bible. It would be, say, like reading science fiction or fantasy novels like The Lord of the Rings. Look at that. You believe in the rapture? Well, it's just like, you know, watching the movie or reading the book, The Lord of the Rings. Just so long as you're not deceived into thinking that it represents biblical theology. It's astonishing, if I'm correct about this, American evangelism is very widely misled, even uh, is widely misled that it has departed from the, oh, look at this, historic position about the second coming of Christ. You see what he just did? He put the interpretation of church history over the Bible. He put the interpretation of church history, which we covered last week, superimposed over the biblical text. This is so common in those that deny the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture. In fact, forget about history. Let's go back to the beginning of Christianity and see if it's true. How do you do that? You open your Bible and see if it's in there. He says that's really, it's rather sobering because if we're wrong about this, what other things have we misinterpreted? So we're wrong about the rapture. Maybe people are going to think we're wrong about the Trinity or the virgin birth. Now, here's someone that basically evangelical scholarship almost worships. Uh, People will just flock to these conferences where this man is speaking, N.T. Wright. My name for him is N.T. Wrong (laughs) because I found myself disagreeing on so many things he says. But N.T. Wright writes, when Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, people were worried that when Jesus returned, those who were dead would, would stay dead and miss out on the new day. 
Some people have taken the verses that followed literally. Well, there's the problem right there. He's upset with people that are taking the Bible literally. Now, literal interpretation, acknowledging figures of speech when they're conspicuous in the text, is how you interpret any other sane piece of literature. Why not the Bible? Now, N.T. Wright has given us this whole paragraph here. You know what he expects of me? He expects me to take him literally. But he doesn't want me to apply that to the Bible. I mean, if I went into his text here and just rewrote it and allegorized it, he would be outraged at that. Uh, it's like one of my, uh, you know, professors um, would go on and on about how the Bible is not necessarily literal and we need to be open to a symbolic interpretation of things. And then he would turn around and remind us of the syllabus which tells you when the paper is due, when the final is. And I didn't do it, but I felt like sticking up my hand in class and saying, well, you know, you interpret the syllabus your way. I interpret it my way. I mean, you can see how that rule would be not tolerated in that classroom. And that's what they want us to do with the Bible, particularly the rapture. The more committed you become to literal interpretation the more obvious the doctrine of the rapture is. But the problem is that it is not what the verse is about. Paul is awfully good at mixed metaphors. Now, we believe in metaphors when they're in the text, but we don't just turn everything into a metaphor, or else you could say that Jesus' resurrection was a metaphor. When Jesus comes back, it's not to snatch people away from the earth, but rather to transform the earth with the life of heaven and to transform us as well. So you see how the earth is a, is a big subject in these people? They don't like the idea that this earth is going to be judged. And I would say that's lurking pantheism, perhaps without even recognizing it. He doesn't come back to take us away, but to heal the world and to transform his people. And then we have uh, Hank Hennegraaff. Um, Hank Hennegraaff wrote a book called The Apocalypse Code. Hank Hennegraaff is another tough one for me because as a new Christian, I grew up appreciating a lot of the things he said concerning the cults and the prosperity gospel and things like that. But notice that over the course of time, or I noticed that over the course of time, Hennegraaff was becoming, in his, re, uh, his ministry at the Christian Research Institute, progressively more anti-rapture, anti-Israel. He ultimately ended up joining the Greek Orthodox Church, Hank Hennegraaff did. So that sort of shows his trajectory. And I'm seeing this in an awful lot of these scholars. They're moving away from a Bible-based evangelical mindset into a mindset that says the grass is greener on the other side. So they move into more of a mystical approach to Christianity, a Roman Catholic sort of approach to Christianity, an Eastern Orthodox approach to Christianity, which takes tradition and superimposes it over the Bible. My trajectory has been the exact opposite. I started there. I don't know, there, there, there isn't anything there to go back to. It's an empty cistern. And I moved away from that into more of a biblical-centered, fundamental, fundamental understanding of the Bible. But these guys, you'll notice, are going the opposite direction. And as they go in that opposite direction, they get more and more hostile towards the rapture and a future for the nation of Israel. So someone calls Hennegraaff's show and he says, what I'm trying to understand is where do they get the teaching that the church will be raptured out and will, and will not have to go through the tribulation? Where is that found? Hennegraaff's answer, it's not found. That's the whole point. The point is it's something that is imposed on scripture. The portion is a very new portion in church 
history. It's a 19th century notion that was popularized by John Nelson Darby. Now, go back and listen to what we said last week in this series because we answered that objection there. It comes with the presupposition that God has two distinct people and therefore he has two distinct plans. The two distinct people. And he has distinct phases for the second coming and two distinct destinies. Well, why can't God do that? I mean, isn't God a God of variety? Isn't there male and female? Uh, Aren't there good angels and fallen angels? Doesn't God have a plan for unsaved humanity and saved humanity? And he acts like if you see a plan of God for the church as distinct from a plan for God for Israel, then there's something wrong with you. But to me, it fits perfectly God's character and nature. He says this, however, is an imposition of Scripture because the truth of it is God has only and always had only one chosen people. So basically what he believes is the church is now the Israel of God, which is replacement theology is what he believes. So I would say he's, rather than us imposing our assumptions on the Bible, that's exactly what he's doing. And he does this all under the title, The Bible Answer Man. Notice the definite article in front of Answer Man. He's holding himself out as the authority on the Bible. This, however, is an imposition of Scripture because the truth of it is God has only always had one chosen people, one covenant community, beautifully connected by the cross and illustrated by a cultivated olive tree in Paul's letters to the Romans. Now, Hanegraaff is very good at these rhymes and alliterations and his ability to memorize things. And a lot of people are kind of wowed by that, but those aren't arguments. I mean, just because you get up and sound good and can weave words together like a wordsmith and make things rhyme and sound the same is not an argument. That's what you call sophistry. And Paul is very clear on this in Romans 16, not to be swayed by the smooth talking. He says, one covenant community beautifully connected by the cross and illustrated by a cultivated olive tree in Paul's letters to the Romans. So the point here is that all those who are followers of Jesus are the chosen people. And this is prior to the cross as well because all that look forward to Christ prior to the cross are God's covenant chosen people. And the covenant chosen people are made up of people from every tongue and language and nation. You are not a son of Abraham because you have, have some sort of genealogical construction. See what he's doing there? He's writing national Israel out of the program of God. We have inherited Israel's promises You are a son of Abraham because you believe in the God of Abraham. Now, Galatians 3 tells us that we are the seed of Abraham. But the reason we're the seed of Abraham is not because we've taken over Israel's place. It's because there's a single point of commonality between us and Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith alone. Genesis 15, verse 6. We, Abraham looking forward, we looking backward to what Jesus did, are also justified by faith alone. That's why we're the seed of Abraham. Not because we have taken over Israel's position in what is called uh, replacement theology. And when you get to the end of Galatians 3, you'll see the word promise used in the singular. We have not taken over Israel's promises, but we are tied into a promise. The single point that connects us with Abraham is justification by faith alone. In that sense only are we the seed or the sons and daughters or the children of Abraham. So he's referring to Galatians 3 to teach replacement theology. That is not at all what that chapter is teaching. Here's another tough one for me. Joel Richardson, 
uh, again, it's a case where he's actually contacted me and asked my opinion on things. He's in, in, asked me to endorse some of his books. Um, he's got a lot of good teaching on prophecy. But he's very much into the Islamic identification of the Antichrist. He thinks the Antichrist has to be Muslim. And he's very much against the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. So he says, what if the end of the world isn't really as so many have portrayed it? What if the church is not raptured to heaven before the great tribulation as many are teaching? What if the church has been left ill-prepared to face the Antichrist and the mark of the beast? Now here comes another line of attack. Because we teach this, that we're going to be removed before the tribulation period starts, we're leaving the church ill-equipped to face the tyranny of the Antichrist. What we really ought to be telling people is to get your gold and to get your guns and to be a prepper because you're going to eyeball it with the Antichrist. And if we're not screaming this message at people every single week, we're leaving them ill-prepared and giving them a false hope because they're going to face the Antichrist. Well, let me just say something about that. I believe in gold. I believe in guns. I believe in prepping. To me, it makes sense, particularly based on what's happened to our country and our world the last couple of months. Things go wrong in a fallen world. But I don't do it because of my eschatological position. I don't do it because I think I'm actually going to eyeball it with the Antichrist. And by the way, if you're going to eyeball it with the Antichrist, do you think your weapons are going to really help you? Well, I'm going to be the last man standing. Well, why, why even do that? I mean, you have no chance against the Antichrist. So prepping, to me, is sort of common sense. But it has nothing to do with my eschatology. And he's making it sound, because we teach the eschatology we do, that we're teaching people to be ill-equipped and ill-prepared. What if Tim LaHaye's claim that if the pre-tribulation rapture is false, then the blessed hope will become the blasted blasted hope actually comes true for millions of pre-tribulationalists? What if millions who have been led astray by the pre-trib rapture teaching become part of the falling away that Jesus warned would take place at that time? Left behind, led astray the issue of the pre-tribulational rapture versus the post-tribulational rapture, that's his view, we're going to go through the whole thing, is one of the premier pastoral issues of our day. If you are a pastor that is not preparing your people to face potentially the Antichrist in the great tribulation in this hour, simply because your denomination teaches it, or whatever. Personally, I think you're falling, failing in your role as a shepherd and a pastor. So if you're not preparing your people to face the Antichrist through arming themselves and all of these kinds of things, then you're setting up a false hope. You're setting up a church that's going to be swept away and greatly disappointed because they're actually going to see the Antichrist. Now, why would churches teach this? He says, well, it's your denomination that forces you. You, You're pre-tribulational because your denomination forces you to believe it. So it's the idea that you didn't come to this position through a careful examination of the Bible. You came to this position because you want a job. So their view of us is we just really have never investigated this biblically because it's not in the in the Bible. By the way, I love getting advice to pastors from people that as far as I can tell are not pastors and never have been pastors. I mean, the best I can tell, this guy has absolutely no pastoral experience on his resume whatsoever. And yet he's educating the rest of us on how to be pastors. You find this an awful lot in this kind of literature. Uh, Here's another sad one. This is from the son of the late Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer was a pretty good guy of Labrie. 
He had a son named Frankie, though, who turned out to be a real rapture um, hater. I just have a couple of more slides here. He says, the evangelical Christian movement in America latched on to a 19th century concept that was hatched by someone called John Nelson Darby, who said that Jesus could not come back until Israel had been restored as a nation populated by the Jews with Jerusalem as its capital. Let me just stop right there. That is not what the Pre-Trib view says. The Pre-Trib view says Jesus can come back anytime. And the restoration of the Jews to the land is preparatory, not for the rapture, there is no sign for the rapture, but for the coming seven-year tribulation period. So you find this a lot where they're critiquing something that they don't fully understand, and they misstate what we're saying. This is not traditional Christian teaching in the Protestant church. This was not a concern of Martin Luther or the Roman Catholics or the Greek Orthodox, whom, by the way, Hank Hanegraaff joined with or the Greek Orthodox, or anyone else. When I was a kid, now, now he's tearing down what his father did through Labrie, the late Francis Schaeffer, a great Christian apologist. When I was a kid, my parents had their ministry in Labrie. We had a number of Christian leaders come by. One of them, Hal Lindsey, had written a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, in which he predicted the end times, coming in the 1980s. I think Hal Lindsey has goofed up on that, and I don't agree with everything Hal Lindsey says. I agree with a lot of what he says. Continuing, he said it is now possible because Israel has been restored, and that others can come back and said, no, no, Jesus can't come back yet because Jerusalem is not restored. The bottom line is the rapture can happen whether Jerusalem is restored or not, because it's imminent. Continuing, Fast forward to the 16 books and four films that had come back, come out of the Left Behind series, written by a friend of mine, Jerry Jenkins, and his sidekick co-author, Tim LaHaye, that wrote it with him, and you've got 60 million copies sold that essentially are totally fiction. They're not fiction. The genre is fiction. But Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins were careful to be in consultation with theologians to make sure that what they were presenting in their fiction series was biblically accurate. You say, well, how do you know that? I know that because I'm on the board for Tim LaHaye's research group called the Pre-Trib Study Group that meets every single December in Dallas. I know, I know all the people. And I I know for a fact that Tim LaHaye, when he had questions about things that they were going to put in their series, consulted people that know an awful lot about theology. And they're making it sound like the whole thing is fiction. The, The Left Behind series, let me tell you something about the Left Behind series. The Left Behind series put into a readable form a fiction story based on true theology and gave our theological system to people that will never go to church. They will never darken the door of a church, nor will they pick up our boring 500-page systematic theology volumes. But they'll read a fiction series. And I know countless people that have been touched by that series. And before that, I know countless people, even myself included, that were touched in a very special way by Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And so John Walvoord himself was asked at one of these meetings, what do you think about the Left Behind series? He said this, and I love this quote. He says, it proves that God has a sense of humor. Because God is accomplishing through a fiction series what the church won't talk about. So God said, okay, the theologians won't talk about it, the pastors won't talk about it, I'm going to get it out to the masses anyway via a fiction series based on biblical truth. That's that's the reality of the Left Behind series. And the reason they don't like the Left Behind series is it became wildly successful. I think largely because God blessed it. And these guys don't like the fact that people are learning theology in an end run around them. 
People are learning theology outside of their churches, their books, their seminaries. That's why there's this hostility against the Left Behind series. And you've got 60 million copies that essentially are total fiction. I'm going to give you an analogy. This, this is if the Twilight Zone had been taken as gospel by some religious group. And they were going back through old episodes and basing an entire cultic religion on it. So if you believe in the rapture, it's like watching the Twilight Zone. Remember Rod Serling? Or, as we saw earlier, it's like reading Lord of the Rings. Last slide. I know I'm a tad over. But we have no children to dismiss to Sunday school, so I can just keep on going, right? I won't do that to you. But last one is John Piper, and this is right off his Desiring God website. He's asked a question, Pastor John, I know this is a huge debate, but I would love your thoughts on how many times is Jesus coming back? Is he coming back in the rapture according to 1 Thessalonians 4? 16 and 17, and then returning a second time to defeat Satan in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. Is Christ returning one more time or two more times? John Piper. My my understanding of the New Testament is that Jesus promised that he would return and that in his returning he would do a final rescue from those who are trusting him and a final judgment for those who are believing in him. But I don't think there are two comings of Christ in the future but only one. So he's going back to the post-trib position where you take the rapture and the second advent and you sandwich it into one event. And he says here, this is what Jesus promised. No, Jesus did not promise that. In John 14, verses 1 through 4, he said, In my Father's house are what? Many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now just think about this for a minute. If the rapture and the second coming are simultaneous, if the church goes up only to come right back down, post-tribulational, post-tribulationalism, then why has Jesus spent 2,000 years on heavenly dwellings that we won't need? I mean, we have to need them at least for seven years, according to our view. We have an answer for it. But his view, there is no answer. And so it's interesting that when you get to a specific question like that, they just skirt over it. Or they don't address it. And so you might be looking at sort of all of these attacks on the pre-tribulational rapture, and you might just kind of throw your hands up in the air and say, well, if these high-powered evangelicals can't agree on this, then what's little old me supposed to think about it? And so where we're going in this series is I want to communicate to you that you can actually develop certainty on the pre-tribulational rapture doctrine. You can look in your Bible and say this is a true doctrine, just like the Trinity is a true doctrine, eternal security is a true doctrine, etc., etc., etc. And I think this is the kind of teaching that Christians need, and if they don't receive it, they're just going to keep getting blown about by all of these winds of false doctrine, particularly as things like, like we've experienced in the last couple of months are happening in our country and people are interested in the end times. And unless they're really fortified on this issue based on what the Bible says, they're just going to be blown to and fro. So I'll, I'll be trying to communicate that you don't have to throw your hands in the air and give up. God has communicated something to us uh, in what is called the blessed hope. Now, when I was becoming coming of age as a Christian, I was interested in all of this. And people told me, well, what you need to do is you need to pray for pre and plan for post. So pray, it's pre-trib, but you better be ready in case we have to go through it. Well, That's no position at all, is it? That just, what does that leave? That leaves nothing but ambiguity in the mind of the child of God. 
So I started looking into it, and I think, the, I think there's a, a very powerful biblical case that can be made for pre-trib. And so all of that to say is we don't have to succumb to the post-modernity of our age and just throw up our hands in the air and say, well, nobody can know, because you can know, and I'll be sharing with you seven reasons why as we continue on in this series. Let's pray. Father, we just are grateful for your truth and your word, the hope and the certainty that it gives us. We need it in the times in which we're living. And I just pray that you'll help us to be good stewards of this section of your word in light of these various uh, attacks on on things that you have disclosed. We'll be careful to all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. We'll see you at 1130 Central for the book of Philippians. God bless you.